Welcome to Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes as we're here to break down all that is happening with respect to the New York football Giants in multiple ways. You can interact with us here on the program. Give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also hit us up on Twitter, hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, as well as Giants.com slash podcast. So, no practice again today, Paul, for the Giants. Right. Jonathan and I were on yesterday. Unfortunately, the air quality was not good, and that to me was a no-brainer. That's why Brian Dable decided, hey, they'll move everything to next week when they have mandatory minicamp. They'll have their two practices, and then obviously they'll have their month hiatus before the start of training camp in late July. Now, let's understand a couple of things. That would have been OTA number nine. This would have been OTA number 10. They've now lost those. They still had meetings. Yep. They still went through the weight training and conditioning inside the uh, the facility over here. But they just did not go to the field house to practice. And Dable said, you know, we no, we can't make them up. But the trainers and doctors decided it was better we didn't do it, so they didn't do it. So they will go into next week's two-day minicamp having only had eight OTAs. And to be frank with you folks, outside of the two periods where they do seven-on-seven, seven, it's all individual drills anyway. There, there's not a tremendous amount of reps there that they're going to gain much from. And if you look around the league, Paul, there's been teams canceling practices left and right. And I'm not saying that has nothing to do with league punishment. That has to do with just personal choice. So I think each team knows what's best for its own group of players. And I don't think the Giants are losing out on a whole lot in terms mm. of the well-being and the outlook of this team. I will let the folks know around the country, and I know we have even fans around the world who watch Big Blue Kickoff Live. The good news is the air quality index has significantly improved to the point where this morning we can actually see some blue skies and 100%. some clouds. Sure. And they've told us now the air is, quote, moderate. Good is the best level. Then moderate is the second level where they just tell you, you know, it's, it's a little bit polluted, but you can deal with it. Well, that's where we are today. And so it's a tremendous, tremendous improvement from what it was. And to be frank with you, you know, Coach Dable said yesterday, you know, we'll probably cancel tomorrow too because let's just wait for this whole thing to blow over. Today they probably could have practiced. Could have, sure. But, but he made the decision yesterday, and I think it was prudent given the circumstances that he was facing at the time. Yeah, and in the big picture of things, I think that they will be able to make up whatever they missed out on during the course of mandatory minicamp as well as in training camp, obviously, when the pads go on and you're mm -hmm. really truly testing out the physicality of your team. I think it was... Mike Kafka, actually, when he spoke with the media yesterday, the reporters were asking him about specific players. And it was even, I think, Thomas McGahey, actually, I stand corrected. He was asked about monitoring the return guys. And he said, yeah, it's all cute now. Everybody's in shorts, right? In shorts, right? Didn't he <laughs> yeah, say something like yes, that? So, I mean, even the coaches understand. There's only it. so much you're going to take away from what goes on during this time period. That's why it's smarter to not expose your players to any questionable air and wait till obviously things clear out for the good next week. Look, Dable, Kafka, Martindale, McGahee, the three coordinators and the head coach understand how this equation works. I mean, Dable said the other day, the preseason snaps will be the primary determining factor as to who makes this team and who starts and who sits where on the depth chart. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Yes, every day does count. They do tape. Even these OTAs, they're sure. taking yeah. video of it, okay? And they do count. But the preseason snaps are really going to be the overwhelming factor upon which decisions are made. And so when you, you know, understand that part of it, these two days, it's not that big a deal. Well, speaking of McGahee, and yesterday Jonathan and I were getting into Wink Martindale's comments, so I wanted to delve more into what McGahee and Kafka had to say yesterday. Thomas McGahee was pressed a lot on, obviously, the new kickoff rule, and one of the things he was asked about is, you know, testing the waters with your return men, even though it's now more of an incentive to not return the ball, right, and just take the ball in the 25. And, you know, even he was reflecting on the fact during the preseason, you're still going to have guys return just to see what they could do. Mm -hmm. you know, even if you don't do it regularly, Paul, right, in the regular season, you need to see what they could do. You can only take so much away, which is what you were getting at in practice, even during this time period where you're just 
hoping the guy catches the ball, but after that, he's not doing anything with it because it's against dead air. So the preseason is critical because you can only simulate so much during the course of a regular practice. That's why I think this kickoff rule, it's going to have a toll on the regular season decision-making, but I don't think actually it's going to change the philosophy of what teams do in the preseason because if you don't have opportunities to give the green light to your return man in the regular season, Mm -hmm. you're going to have to do it in the preseason as a result. You know, there are so many players, and and McGahee even mentioned guys like uh, Cam Brown, you know, and and Carter Carter Coughlin, Coughlin. who asked him about, you know, well, you know, they're primarily special teams guys. So how will this impact not only their value to the team, but you have to wonder a little bit in the back of your head, what does this do to the odds of me making the team? Roster spot. You know, if if my value is primarily rooted in special teams, and now they're saying one part of that special teams chart is being eliminated, where does that put me? Look, I still think that special teams are important. I think the reason for me, that they will maintain a critical part of the game, even in light of the new rule, is that you have enough of guys who want to drop the ball, punters in particular, not so much kickoff guys. Obviously, the kickoff rule is is going to neuter a lot of it. Yeah. But your punters need those gunners to be able to get downfield and be able to down balls inside the 10, inside the 5, sure. wherever the case may be. I know what you're going to say to me. Well, just kick the ball out of bounds. You know what? A guy like Jeff Eagles, you know, where he was so good at downing the ball where he wanted it to be, yes, he could surgically kick it out where he wanted, but there were many a times where, you know, David Tyree would get down there and down the ball. Yep. Well, that's why special teams gunners, in my opinion, will still hold their value because in the punt game, You will still need those guys. They will still have to make plays that will alter field position. And guys that could tackle, too, out in open space as well. So, you know, that's where the Cam Browns and the Carter Coughlins come into play, especially if they can hold value in that department. So I'm with you. You know, we're focusing on the kickoff, but the NFL is not eliminating the punt. And it goes without saying your kicker, your punter, and your long snapper are always going to have a role on the team. So it's not as if you could sacrifice one of those positions. Mm -hmm. Guys are going to still be able to carve out roles on special teams. It's just, and I think this is what was important that McGahee was hitting on yesterday. As a coach, you have only so many plays that you could put your imprint on a game, Paul, in terms of game planning, scheme. And if you remove kickoff returns, right, you're lessening the opportunity for a special teams coach to push the buttons of his team and get it to add up to something that could maybe change field positioning. For example, you know, I don't I'll let you sure jump in here real quickly. The infamous play because it's infamous because it's controversial to this day when Tennessee returned it with Dyson for a touchdown against yeah, Buffalo. Yeah, the Tennessee miracle. Correct. Exactly. Music City miracle. Well, I mean, you're not going to have an opportunity to maybe scheme up a play like that in today's game. Mm-hmm. Right? But 25 30 years ago, Special teams coordinators had an opportunity to do that. So that's what I think McGahee was getting at. You know, you want to have an opportunity to get creative with your coaching staff and practice it out on the field and carry it over. And there just may not be, as I like to use a baseball analogy, at bats in order to achieve that. Now, as McGahee also said, it is what it is. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. That's his quote. Well, he has no control over it. Because I have no control over it. And they're going to tell me what the rules are and I'll play the cards that I'm dealt. So... He was not going to necessarily opine in an awful lot of ways. But I wondered why nobody in the newspaper press corps bothered to ask about the XFL kickoff rule, which was purposely installed in the new league to eliminate or at least reduce injuries. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to read it to you because you probably haven't seen it, okay? Uh, You have the ball is placed at the 35, okay? And I'm sorry, the 30, the kicker lines up at his 30. The other 10 members of the kickoff team line up at the opponent's 35, five yards away from the return team. Only the kicker and the return guy can move until the ball is fielded. Okay. Touchbacks come out to the 35. You know, I've watched a little bit of the XFL. I've seen it. It was weird at first. I had to get used to it. I watched it a little bit more. 
you know what? I think I'd be willing to give it a try. I think I, I probably like it a little bit better than the new rule that the NFL just put in this year. But nobody asked Coach McGahee about that. He probably would have said it doesn't matter. Because yeah, I don't think he would have. That rule's not in play anyway, so I have yep. no opinion. I'm sure that that's what his answer would have been. But the appropriate question would have been, okay, not that it matters, but what do you think of that rule? You've seen that in play in the XFL. What do you think of it? Maybe he might have answered that question that way. Well, here's the other thing, and this I would have also liked maybe somebody to have asked McGahee, and I've brought this up on some of my serious shows in conversation with other former special teams coordinators. What I think gets missed in this conversation is if you're on the coverage team, okay, and you're trying to block for your return man as well, you have no idea, Paul, what's going to happen at the end of the play, meaning you don't know whether or not your return guy is going to take a knee. Something crazy could happen, right? The point is, guys are going to still engage in blocking on the play. So if the goal is you want to remove contact from a safety perspective, you're still going to have individuals. My point is, right? I had not thought of that. Contact one another because they still can't take for granted what the outcome of the return is right, going to because be. Because the ball's in the air for X number of seconds, so, right? and you don't know until until the guy gets the ball, until it lands. 100%. So the team kicking off, they're going after the return guy, sure right? They, they are. can't assume that he's going to down and it. And the blockers are and trying to block. the blockers are trying to block. So my point is, how are you making it safer from that standpoint Interesting. if you're still engaging in contact? Well, another reason for the XFL rule. Sure. 100%. But that, to me, is what I don't think enough people are talking about. Forget the fact that you're eliminating the return. What about the other aspects of the play who have Mm -hmm. no idea what the end result is going to be? You make a fair point, Lance. It's very unusual from that standpoint. And then the shame of it is I think the NFL will not even look at the XFL rule. I I know they've looked at it, but I don't think they would make that change because they don't want to be considered copycats. True. And I think maybe more of a toyish type of idea. That gets away from You know, it's too bad because, as you recall, and I know you're still old enough, when the USFL had the two-point conversion and people said, oh, the NFL will never go for that. Well, years later, the NFL went for the two-point conversion. It took them a while. It takes time to warm up to it. You know, but but eventually when they, they got away from the stigma of it being a USFL play, they finally went to it. So maybe after a few years... They'll use the XFL kickoff, but they'll they'll want to get the stench removed from the other league first. Possible. Now, <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to bring up with respect to how this may change just the flow of returns is McGahee was asked about, do you think more teams will rely on the squib kick and entice mm-hmm. you to try to return? And McGahee, you know, like any other special teams coordinator said, well, it's going to be a wait and see type of approach, right? Right, right. now, you would think teams may do something based on the situation, but you can't take that for granted. The other thing that was brought up, speaking of strategy, Paul, Graham Gano is very effective in terms of his kickoffs to try to entice the team at the two-yard line. And McGay, he said, you know, we may not have him do that anymore because what's the purpose of a team returning it from the two if essentially they know they're going to get it at the 25? Why take the risk? Why go out of your way to think that you're going to get 23 additional yards? So, you know, you have to rethink the little subtleties of the kickoff game right now. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So, hey, we'll figure it out a month or two into the season. We'll see some trends, and then we'll finally have a, a handle on it and whether or not we like it or we don't like it. But And, and remember, one-year trial. So it's correct. possible they turn around and say, we didn't like it, mm-hmm. and we go back to normal within a year. That is true. That could happen. That is true. Let's not and rule I, that And out. I'm glad they did that, Yeah, to be frank with you. I am, I am glad. You know, I think there, there are too many times where the league doesn't do that. And and the fact that they've said right from the get-go, this is a one-year tryout and we will reevaluate, I, I think that was a good move. Well, and for people that say, well, you know, that sounds nice, keep in mind, defensive pass interference being reviewed was an absolute nightmare, mm-hmm. and they wound up taking that away. Yes, they did. So we do have evidence of you experiment, doesn't work out, you eliminate it. So it's possible they may not like the results here, and we could go back to what is – synonymous with football for decades. We'll see. Now, I don't think it hurts to try to see whether or not you can improve the game here or there. It's just on the surface, it's hard for me to come to grasp with that this is going to have a positive spin and help the product overall, mm-hmm. at least based on what we're seeing. 
one other thing that I did want to tackle was Mike Kafka. He spoke to the media as well. And, you know, he was asked a lot about the continuity factor, which is what Wink Martindale touched on too. But he was also talking about stage two of the development of individuals on the team. And Daniel Bellinger came up because of the photo. The Incredible sure, Hulk. The, I was <laughs> going to say, I think He-Man is a little bit more fitting. Okay. That's what I was referring to Daniel Masters of the universe. There you go. Exactly. When Skeletor comes out, we know who <laughs> will protect. Or the ultimate warrior for well, that matter. There you go. <laughs> Whatever reference you'd like to throw out here. We're equal opportunists on this program. But in all seriousness, I thought one interesting question that came up in the dialogue about Bellinger mm-hmm. was, do coaches have conversations, Paul, mm-hmm. with the strength and conditioning team mm-hmm. to say, hey, we want to use this guy with more blocking of an emphasis this year, can you work with him in bulking up? I thought that was an interesting question because you don't hear that very often, right? You hear guys go out on their own, they work with their own coaches, they work with their own nutritionists, but is there guidance when a coach goes to the strength and conditioning staff and says, hey, we're going to completely change how we use this player this year. We need you to do a lot of the heavy lifting over the course of the offseason. I'm not saying that Bellinger needed a push in that department, but let's not be naive. There, I'm sure were some conversations say, hey, we utilized you in this way. We want to now take it a step up, and perhaps this is a way for you to improve to add a little bit more meat mm. and potatoes, as I like to call I- it. I think the question had to be asked because people were naive not to understand that. Because quite frankly, in every exit interview that happens every year with every head coach and every player, they get told, what do we expect from you yep. during the offseason and next year? And they are given a rough chart or a diagram by the strength and conditioning guy. This is kind of what we're thinking about. And and that comes in consultation with the coaching staff. It always has. I Actually, I, I was kind of surprised at the question because I thought that everybody knew that. To be frank, well, I just think it was a appropriate follow up because of the fact that everybody was looking at that photo and thinking yeah, that yeah. you know Bellinger took on another person during the course <laughs> of the off season. <laughs> when clearly that's a product of hard work and strength and conditioning. Well, I'll tell you what: if Bellinger is is going to take the next step, certainly he helped himself with his his physique because we know he's a, a solid blocker. That's what he did in college. But if he's going to use that muscle to enhance his blocking skills, the Giants will be very, very happy considering the fact that they got a receiving tight end in Waller, who, by the way, is a big enough guy that he can hold his own as a blocker too. But you would want Bellinger to be the mega blocker, if you will, to complement yep. Waller. It's a good fit and makes an awful lot of sense. And I'm sure Bellinger said to himself when they acquired Darren Waller, okay, you know, I don't want to lose snaps here. I want to find ways to keep myself on the field. What better way to do that mm-hmm. than establish myself as the main blocker? And that's right in his wheelhouse because that's what he did in college. Mm-hmm. They were a run-heavy team. When we saw the Giants draft him, the conversation was solid blocker. What's the potential for him as right. a receiver? And he was a pleasant surprise last season. I think in terms of his contributions as a receiver, yeah. right? Finding the end zone, making contributions in key moments. Unfortunately, he suffered the eye injury because he was playing some of his best football at that time. He did come back, and you know that was him navigating adversity in his young career, which I think in the big picture of things is not a bad thing. But if they could have a nice, versatile one-two punch, which is everyone's ideal game plan, right, when it comes to the NFL, no you want to have a blocking tight end, you want to have a receiving tight end, and you want the blocker to have the capacity to catch so that when both of them are on the field, Paul, defenses are saying they both could run out. It's possible. We can't assume that this guy's going to stay back at the line of scrimmage. I think the Giants now present that. Well, it allows you the opportunity to put Waller in the big slot or even on the boundary while Bellinger's playing maybe the inline tight end. Yep. And you're now saying matchup-wise, how are we going to defend this now? Oh, I'm not, whoa, what's going on here? They got two tight ends on the field, but one guy's really a receiver. Uh, I mean, I yes, I think it's definitely a good thing. And Waller made some big plays, by the way, when they lined him up on the outside for the Raiders. There was a play I remember they were playing the Dolphins. I think it was maybe a Thursday night game. And Waller ran up the left side. Is that line. the 70-yard pass? That yes, he caught? where he threw it literally corner of the end zone, <laughs> leaped up, made the grab. And that was the game, by the way, where I think, I want to say Derek Carr went out and Mariota came in. And Mariota, I think, was the one that threw the football I don't remember on that. that pass. 
Yeah, I, I feel I, pretty I good say, about that. I will that. say this, and I've said it on this program before, and I will continue to say it. I've been to, I was at seven of the eight OTAs, okay? So I've watched most of them. I saw Darren Waller drop one ball. He's got soft hands. He's got a tremendous catch radius. Well, he's some target. And and he knows also, he knows how to position himself to catch the ball by using his body as a shield. And I I look, he'd be a hell of a forward in the NBA, uh, but I'm glad he's a tight end for the Giants. <laughs> Well, there is, in all seriousness, there's a carryover between tight ends and basketball players if you track the history mm -hmm. of some of the most mm -hmm. notable ones. Tony Gonzalez, Tony Gates, yes. all of them have basketball yes. backgrounds. So it's no surprise that I'm sure Waller would fit in very nicely. You could see him doing some of the dirty work, grabbing the rebounds, and so forth. few reminders before we open up the phone lines as those were some takeaways from Thomas McGahee and Mike Kafka who spoke to the media the other day. You could check out the Giants Huddle podcast. You could search for the Giants Huddle. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You go to Giants.com slash podcast. The 2023 NFL schedule is out. So now you can start mapping out perhaps what single game tickets you want to purchase. They're on sale now. Don't miss the Giants at MetLife Stadium this season. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat. And on the topic of tickets, you can also upgrade to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2023 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And Giants TV, that's the official connected TV streaming app. It brings you original video content, game highlights on demand, and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, as well as the Giants mobile app. 201-939-4513, that is the telephone number. Let's open up the phone lines. Jason is in New Haven. He gets us going here on Friday's edition of BBKL. What's happening, Jason? What do you got for us? I'm good. How you guys doing? Good. All right. What's on your mind? Good. Good, good to speak to you guys. Uh, just a few points and then a question, and I'll make it quick. Um... Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, I personally am excited to see what our offense is going to be this year. Um, I know that our offense, I think our offense will look a little different. This is an assumption of mine. Um, now, last year we ran, we did a lot of ball control play action just because, you know, our receiver, our receiver room wasn't, you know, the best in the league, which, you know, which is fair to say. So I think with Waller and, and, and Campbell, um, I think those two alone will be a boom to our offense as far as our receivers. Um, another person I'm excited to see next year, I don't know how you guys feel about it, is Hodgins. I think he's very underrated amongst, even still amongst Giants fans. Uh, when he came on the field last year, it seemed like our offense kind of, I don't want to say took off per se, but it just looked different. It looked more, um, it, it turned more into a passing game. It looked like, when I saw it on mm. on the TV. You make a I good point you... about Hodgins because I think the Giants had such success with him in the second half of the season and in the playoffs that we kind of take for granted the fact that he didn't show up until the end of October. I mean, yeah, he right. wasn't here for training camp or the off season right. or even the first half of the regular season. So I think it's fair to say that we've all sold him short. Isaiah Hodgins... Right who went through two years of injuries when he was on the Buffalo uh, in the Buffalo organization. Yep. He has mm -hmm. upside. I think I think yep. we're all selling him short. I think we're, we're just taking it for granted and saying, "Okay, oh, Hodges was pretty good and that's what he's going to be." You know what? I think I think you've got a great point. Maybe Isaiah Hodgins actually has some more ups that we haven't seen yet and he can be even that's better that. than he was last year. Yeah, I I I I you know, just watching him um, and I'm not comparing him to anybody, but to me, and I know this is a this is a stretch. And forgive me if I, you know, I don't like to compare players, but I don't see him as a number one receiver. But I think he could be a really, really good number two receiver. Just the way he moves in and out of his breaks, mm -hmm. he catches. I don't remember him dropping a lot of passes last year with Daniel. He caught pretty much everything. Um, I'm really excited to see what his what his progression is going to be in our offense. So I'm really excited. And then just one quick question, just a little fun question. Um, in your guys' opinion, you guys have been around the Giants for a long time. I've been watching since 1990, 1989. So is there a player that you guys, 
I don't want to say wish, but is there a player you guys wish either through because of injury or maybe off the field uh, transgressions that you say, you know what, I really wish I saw this. Pl- I really wish I could have seen what this player could have been if not for injury. Terrell or, Thomas. And I'm I'm a big fan of Will Will Hill. Um, I personally thought he was going to be the best safety that I ever played with the Giants. I know that's a stretch, um, but Will Hill and David Wilson would be the two for me. And I'll take your answers off there. I appreciate you All right, guys Jason. taking yep. my call. Appreciate the uh, phone call. I, I have, by the way, Hodgins for one regular season drop against Minnesota and one drop in the playoffs. Well, that's he had, it. He and Daniel Jones had great chemistry they were once terrific. he arrived. So, I mean, to me, that's the positive, considering they didn't have training camp together. Yeah. I'm going back to uh, Terrell Thomas. I don't think there's any question. Of, of, of all the guys that, that I had the opportunity to cover, I'm going into my 41st season now. Thomas but who's is, counting? Thomas yeah. is the guy who, in my mind, there is no question he was a Pro Bowl caliber player. I, I think Kenny Phillips would be the second guy that comes to yeah, mind. Knee issues, yeah. Dominic Hickson's another guy that comes to mind because, you know, he suffered several injuries during the course of his career. I think David Wilson's a good one because I think we're still to this day playing the coulda, woulda, shoulda game with David Wilson. I mean, we saw flashes of dynamic athleticism. The problem is, unfortunately, he just couldn't stay healthy and remain on the field. So I think Wilson's a really good one, but you know, Hickson is also somebody who comes to mind where years where he could have really carved out a larger role maybe as a receiver and a special teams guy and unfortunately you know got hurt in the preseason so I would go with Wilson or Hickson I think those are the two players in particular that come to mind I I would only say this I don't think either one of those guys would have been Pro Bowl players I I mean I didn't think that was part of the question that was being asked well I think I think Thomas and and Phillips could have been Pro Bowl players in fact should have been Pro Bowl players in my opinion you know, and, and, you know, to be honest with you, if you really want to even extend it to a third person, Sean Williams, the former safety out of UCLA, I think could yep. have been that level of player had he not gotten hurt. And Will Hill, who was brought up, to me, it wasn't a matter of health. It was unfortunately a matter of off the field issues. If you just look at his entire right. career. Right. That was really what held him right. back. It wasn't so much the injury bug from and, that standpoint. And just for you, Len, because I know you're watching the show. I know Tucker Fredrickson. I understand. Go right okay. ahead. Now we covered every generation <laughs> and every era in the conversation. We can move on. Andy's in Brooklyn joining us here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. What's happening, Andy? What do you got for us? Hi, guys. How are you? We're doing Hi. all right. Good. Uh, I'm a uh, season ticket holder. This will be my 40th season. Excellent. And I've been a That's one shy of Paul league. for those of you counting at home. But yes, please continue. I said that's one shy of Paul <laughs> no. who is with respect to 41. You just said 41. Yeah, but dad's a season ticket holder. I'm a worker. Okay, well, but we're comparing <laughs> only the facts that were brought. I mean, I wasn't taking a tally of all okay. of your family ties. But Go yes, ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, L- listen, uh, I, I've had a question that's bothered me for years and years that I don't think you guys are going to be able to answer, but I'd like you to try to find out. Well, why don't you try us? Yes, let's see. Okay. Well, everybody and their brother knows that any physical contact with either the sideline or the back line constitutes what? Being out of play, I'm assuming, is what you're getting at? Mm -hmm. Out of bounds, right? Okay. Okay, so let's bring the pylons into the equation. The pylons sit on the intersection with uh, between the uh, the goal line and the sideline and the intersection of the sideline and the back line, correct? I'm yes. following. Okay, but any contact with the pylon is a touchdown. Is a touchdown. Sure. Yeah. Yes. On what planet does that make sense? I really don't want you to open up this can of worms because that is one of many things that I have been angry about for years there are so many rules in the national football league that do not make sense that are inconsistent breaking the plane of the goal line is another one where you have to follow through with the completion of the catch i mean when you break the plane of the goal line right they tell you they tell you it's a dead ball you break the plane of the goal line touchdown but yet if a receiver takes the ball makes the catch and then after his, his feet hit the ground and he falls and gets tackled out of bounds and drops the ball, sorry, 
Sorry, he didn't hold the ball through the completion of the catch. It's not a touchdown anymore. Well, that's the difference between a runner and a receiver. A- and that's, what you're that's at. ridiculous. It's totally contradictory. So please don't open up that can of worms. I agree with you. There are a number of rules in this league that do not make sense, but we have to live with them. Well, but I think, Andy, well, it goes back to you to answering do. your own question. I mean, it's at the intersection of both lines. So it's sort of that gray area, which is in between. I think it's that's what you pretty area. much were getting the, at. The, the pylon, the pylon is a vertical extension. Sure. Of the out of bounds marker. Okay, that's what it is. Well, and it's been you, like that for ages. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't why foresee don't they them. Just move the pylons inside the sideline and inside that uh, the inside that intersection in the back of the end zone. Problem solved. Well, I think part that of the reason – They I, don't I, want to put it in the field of play. Correct, exactly. They don't want it to get in the way of a player tripping over it or whatever it may be in the field of play. I mean, that to me is the most logical reason why they don't do that. I, I understand your point, and logically, if you break it down the way you have, it makes no sense. But that's life, okay? I'm sorry. That's okay. life. All right, Andy. Appreciate okay. the phone. Thanks, Andy. Yep. Just remember, guys, that the, the, football, the football field is not a perfect rectangle, is it? Okay, well, Have a good one. we will speak with the mathematicians to get back to you. I mean, some of the things that people think about in the offseason, it just goes to show well, you, got way too much time on We just hands. discussed a moment ago before the show started about this emergency quarterback rule, which because the emergency quarterback has to come off your active 53 from that week will probably never come into play because teams don't carry three quarterbacks on their 53 anymore. Most teams carry only two. Very rarely does a team carry a third QB on the 53. Unless a guy going in is banged up. Perhaps That's that would give you the That's the only reason. way it's yeah. going to happen. And, you know, maybe it would have happened once or twice in the last how many years? Who knows? Sure. Maybe a team decides they want to carry the third quarterback going into a playoff game because they think that that last guy on the 53 is worthless going into the postseason. So you'd rather protect yourself. On maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But... 99% of the time, that rule will not even come into play because teams will not carry a quarterback, a third quarterback, on their 53 going into a weekend. They're not going to do it. And, you know, when the rule first came out, I don't know if it was ever particularly specified in deeply that he cannot be a practice squad promotion. I have since found out he cannot be a practice squad promotion. He has to be part of your 53, which means the rule is virtually useless. Well, and that's why I'm sure, like anything else, if we get to that point, and remember, it's a very rare occurrence that a team needs to get to a third quarterback. We're no talking about this because of how the Niners game played. Correct. Okay? But once again, you'd be hard-pressed to find enough examples for me to fill up one hand of those instances Mm -hmm. in NFL history. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the first thing I think we need to take a step back with. Number two, I think what you were hitting on, Paul, if you get to the postseason and you're concerned and you say to yourself, dress a third quarterback versus take away the 53rd guy who may get two or three special team snaps, you're going to dress the third quarterback, I would assume. So this way, God forbid, you lose your first two guys, you have your third quarterback. That may be the only time that a team will willingly go to that route. I mean... Let me ask you this, in all honesty, why not just put the rule in play and say that emergency third quarterback can be your practice squad quarterback? What would be so wrong about that? I would have no problem with that. I mean, you could take it a step further, Paul, and say you have a 54-man roster in the postseason. You keep your 53, and then the third quarterback doesn't count against the 53. He's the 54th guy. He could be in uniform. He could hold a clipboard. Mm Mm-hmm. Or you could say, keep him back in the locker room and you don't bring him out until you get into that situation. Whatever I would have you, no issue with doing that too. Whatever you want to do, yeah. it seems to me, if they really wanted to fix that problem, even though it will rarely happen anyway, if you truly want to fix it, allow him to be the practice squad quarterback. Because, I mean, in fairness, you're not giving a team a competitive edge by saying you're just going to have a third emergency quarterback available. No. I mean, unless... He's an exquisite play caller, and you're giving him a headset. But the bottom line is you'd have rules to say the guy can't wear a headset. He can't communicate, right? You'd have him limited, and then in the event you'd have to turn to him, you it turn to him. It makes too much sense I have for no the league to that. do it. Okay? So, again, Andy was his name? Yes. Andy, Andy, 
I have a bunch of these things. I got a whole clipboard at home with rule changes that would make a lot more sense well, than what they have. But we're not going to go there. Well, but none of your things, at least with respect to the quarterback rule, has anything to do with geography, whether or not the field is a real rectangle, and the borderline between the end line okay, and the goal line. Okay, you know We're talking about X's and O's situations. There's a distinct difference, Paul. In terms of taking I got you. the nuance of the game, I, I have a, I have a concussion list rule too that I really believe should be in play. In, in play, but you have a lot of lists. Apparently, I do. I yeah. do. There's only so many just, lists the NFL can adopt. They just we have you know, the IR whatever, list. You know. Whatever. It's look. We we got to play by the book that they give us, right? That's Indeed. it. All right. Let's head back to lines. You goes in New Jersey. He joins us here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. What's happening? You go. Hey. Good afternoon, guys. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, What's on your mind? Um. You know, the uh, Daniel Bellinger picture uh, got me thinking <laughs> about somewhat of a weird topic, I guess. But, you know... Um, you have an issue with the pie line, too? Is that it? You think he's no, going to knock no, it over? No, 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 no. I'm not going... We're not going to talk about the Pythagorean theorem. Oh, okay. Either. That's too bad. I was looking forward to that. I was going <laughs> to debate obtuse and perpendicular <laughs> angles next, too. So, we have a lot on the agenda. No, um... So that, that picture of Bellinger got me thinking, and um, I've been tracking kind of Paul's prior comments about players who have made uh, visible physical transformations during the off season, And my list includes, I hope I got these right, Ryder Anderson, yep. uh, Micah McFadden, yep. uh, Jalen, Jalen Hyatt compared yep. to how he looked at Tennessee. And I'm wondering if there's uh, any others um, that – you know, struck you as being noticeably different. Uh, be, be, before I finish my question, though, I, I did kind of notice from uh, the interviews you've posted in the past that uh, Andrew Thomas looked thicker in the upper body, and he did make a comment that one of his off-season objectives was to add power to take on bull rushes. So I don't know if Andrew Thomas looked visibly different to you, but... I can't say uh, that he has. I yeah. would add to that list, though, Leonard Williams looks a little bit thicker to me, too. And I'm uh -huh. saying in a good way. Okay. Yeah, okay. Andrew okay. Thomas was at the podium the other week. He didn't look that different from no, he did. how Not he appeared the previous different. season. Okay. Yeah. okay, fair enough. That, then, then my second question is, you know, the recent reported signing of Leonard Floyd by the Bills reminded me that there's still you know, a reasonable amount of talent in the um, veteran free agent market for both uh, edge rushers and off-the-ball linebackers. Mm -hmm. So, hypothetical question, if Joe Shane uh, could manipulate and make some cap room and you could only sign one player, who would you prioritize, edge rusher three or off-ball linebacker Two and what is your rationale for that priority? All right, you go. Appreciate the phone call. The other guy worth mentioning, by the way, is Frank Clark, who yesterday joined the Denver Broncos. Mm -hmm. So there's two guys that are now off the market, Floyd and Frank Clark, two guys that True. certainly can help their respective new pass rushing groups. As far as which position I'd prioritize, I would prioritize the third edge rusher. I talked about this with you, Paul, on the show. When you have a third guy that can give you six to seven sacks – and that's icing on the cake. And right now, I think it remains to be seen whether or not the Giants have somebody that can consistently get to that territory because, you know, Jihad Ward is the guy that comes to mind that is your third X factor in that group, but he's not known as a sack guy. Heck of a player, great hustler, and somebody that can get out on an open field, make tackles. So I would say I would prioritize the third edge rusher more so than the off-ball linebacker. Yeah, I think the problem there, and I know his uh, asterisk was if you could make the money or find the money, the third edge rusher is going to cost you more than the extra off-ball linebacker will. Well, especially if you look at what Floyd and Frank Clark got, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So Clark's got a lot of incentives, but still. Right. So if you're telling me that money is not a factor, and I wish it wasn't, but the salary cap makes it a factor, I probably would say the off-ball linebacker only because it would require less jimmying with the Giants' cap number to try to get somebody in here. Now, would I like a bona fide, proven veteran edge rusher who could absolutely 100% make that room a more dangerous room? Sure, who wouldn't? You know, who wouldn't? But 
we just saw Marcus Golden, I think, signed with the Steelers. Yep. Right? We saw Frank Clark is, is off the market now. We've seen, I think, the Gakwe's still out there. And Gakwe's still out there, okay. and Jadevian Clowney is right. still and out Clowney there, Clowney is still out there. Yes. Now, I mean, I look, who else are the, quote, Higher level edge rushers are still sitting. On yeah, I'm the looking through the list. Melvin Ingram. We actually, if you remember, we went over an NFL.com list about Ingram, a week ago. Ingram is really long in the tooth. Justin Houston. He's also Houston's long in the tooth. Very yeah. long in the well, tooth. Well, I mean, these are the guys that are uh, Carlos Dunlap, another veteran up there in age. You know, I'm actually surprised. Matt Ioannidis, who I know is not an edge rusher, but a really good interior guy. Yeah, that, he is. I think yeah, he's he probably more surprising than all the other guys. And Ioannidis is 29. So I would not put him in the same department. If you need somebody who could play inside, outside, that get after the quarterback, I mean, he to me would be a really nice addition in the early stages of training camp. At this point, though, if you were to go after a guy, I'd put in Gakwe at the top of the list. In terms of age and production, Paul, that would be the guy that I would say is worth going after because the other players we mentioned are up there in age, and you hope that obviously they could hold up for an entire season. But I think in Gakwe... There's still plenty of gas in that tank. I mean, he's been productive. It's just a matter of, I he's think, He's a one-dimensional player. Well, that's why. Teams have been hesitant. And, and he's going to ask you for a lot of money. Well, but then again, when the demand is not overwhelming, it changes perhaps the perspective of the player. And who knows? Injuries, unfortunately, are going to happen during the course of training camp. player like him may get a golden opportunity if somebody we never expected goes down. I'm not saying for the Giants. I'm just saying across the league. But and Gakwe, to me, is the next guy, I would say, that probably is going to land somewhere. Now, interestingly enough, okay, if you want to talk about linebackers, to be frank with you, I'd have no problem bringing back Landon Collins. Knows the system. I, I, I would bring him back on a very inexpensive contract. He showed last year that he still has some flash ability to make some plays. He wants to be here. He knows the system. He would not cost you a lot of money. Uh, I'd br rather bring back Landon Collins over Nagakwe. Again, he's also not going to cost you a fraction sure. of money. Well, but I think going back so to— So value, for value, I'd rather have a Collins. Well, you're living more in the real world in terms of your response. And I rarely do that. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, look at this. Pigs are flying outside, apparently. The smoke is gone and pigs are flying. But I'm going back to the caller. The way the caller uh, framed the question, though, in fairness, was ideally you can go after whoever you'd like. So I answered the well, question. Ideally, there that. wouldn't be a salary cap anymore well, either. No, please, we don't need to go down uh, that road. No, thank okay. you. Well, no, no. Let me ask you. No, but in all seriousness, okay, if you had no limitations from a financial standpoint, and Gakwe versus Landon Collins slash linebacker. You still wouldn't go after Ngakwe? Because I'd go after Ngakwe. If there's no question about money, I'm going after Ngakwe. Even if he's not the best overall run defender, I'd still take him for pass rushing situations. You know what? I just, I agree with you that you're talking about an impact pass rusher. I absolutely understand that. I also understand that with Wink Martindale and the way that he uses his guys and he's more scheme-oriented than he is necessarily just one guy putting up numbers. You know, look, maybe I'm just prejudiced because I'm, I'm a Landon Collins guy. I'd, I'd like to see Collins in there because I know there's a lot of things he can do with him. Nagakwe is a one-dimensional guy. That's all he is. He does one thing for you. He's going to stand up on the edge, and he's going to try to beat his guy one-on-one -on -one Well, but for the, the third pass That's rusher— That's all he's going to do. But for the third pass rusher, I would say that fits the bill, though. Well, how many snaps does he play for the money you're going to pay him? All things you got to take into consideration. But Collins again, probably would find himself on the field a lot more than Nagakwe would in this He may be more bang system. for the buck. That's fair. Sure. Right? Yeah. Well, but then again, remember, the Giants, Dane Belton— you're hoping to get more playing time out of him. You brought in Bobby McCain. We'll see whether or not he could carve out a role. Landon, the opportunity, Paul, is maybe not as large as it was the way we were talking about that safety position last year. It's changed a bit. I think I think there are a lot of angles you have to be able to, to get through before you can answer that question. I don't think it's a five-second answer. Yes, this is the guy I'd want. I think there there are a number of levels to the question. Is Nagakwe a more impactful player? There's no question about that. He's probably the most impactful free agent available on the market right now. Yep. No one's going to say otherwise. He's had what twenty sacks yeah, in the I last mean, look two at years? his sack production. Correct. I'm I'm please. Yeah. So don't out there. There's probably somebody who's snickering about this. Well, yes, the Ngakwe family's listening, and they're very disturbed. Right. So I hope so, you so understand what you're doing. Nobody is denying Ngakwe's impact as a pass rusher. Okay, I get that what he is. 
I tend to look at other parts of the of the prism. And I'm looking at how many snaps you're going to get, what kind of money do you have to pay him. So what is your your what 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 does that uh, John like to say? Uh, um, dollars per product. Uh, yeah, dollars. What's 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 his abbreviation? DPP dollars per production. Uh, no, is what you're no. Uh, well, I call it bang for your buck. That's what I call bang it. for you. Okay, bang I for mean, your. You could adopt mine if you want. You know, that's I I. I don't know. I I, I would kind of lean towards I'd like to have Landon Collins back. But again, I can't separate the value and the salary cap issue from it. I just can't do no, it. I know. Well, once again, we and, were... And the fact that Nagakwe is so one-dimensional. I thought, you know, the fact that... that, that By the uh, time Wink, this show ends, maybe he'll be well, two-dimensional. Wink runs this this kaleidoscope Rubik's Cube type of, of defense. And Nagakwe doesn't do much for a guy like that. Well, but once again, I think Wink would put him on the field in a position yeah. where you're, right. you're going after That's the true, too. I, I don't think Wink is going to put a player in a That's position. That's true, too. All right, so call up Nagakwe. See if he'll take there a one-year minimum. Look at this. You're coming to your All senses. Right. You go, go. Hey, Yannick, one-year <laughs> minimum to come to the Giants. He's got it set for you. 10 sacks, 23 quarterback hits in 2021 with the Raiders, and then last season, nine and a half sacks, 16 quarterback hits. I mean, that is some solid production for a guy who could be a situational pass rusher. And that's why I'm a bit surprised I get it. that he's still out it. there, but he may just be waiting to see what the present, what the opportunities are in front of him in terms of the beginning of training camp. No and, doubt. you know, a lot of guys, you know, they don't want to be with a team That's for OTAs right. in the spring. We've talked about that time and time again. So that would not surprise me from that standpoint. All right, let's head back to the phone lines. Charlie's in Portland, Maine, and I'm sure he'll have so much to add about Yannick Ngakwe. You know how we should, before we get Charlie, actually, because if we could delay his call at any time, I'll be more than happy. We should have Landon Collins and Yannick Ngakwe tell us whether or not they're pro-pylon being on the end line or the goal line or they are anti that. That's how we solve okay. whether or not They'll have value. But, yes, go ahead, Charlie. Hey, Lance. I, I, lo I love that, like, the time the show ends, maybe a Gakwe would have more than one move. So that was <laughs> well, well, I'm glad you got to – well, because Paul said one-dimensional 17 times. So I was hoping maybe he'd become two-dimensional by the end of the program. But I'm glad you caught on to that. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, two guys that were Giants who got injured, one was Steve Smith. which That's I, a good one. You know, yeah. Wow, look at this. And the other one – Actually, he didn't play for us, but we drafted him and he got injured with a car accident. It was Chad Jones. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the draft pick. Sure. You know? Legitimate considerations, they would not be in my top three. But legitimate uh, considerations. Steve Smith's so a good one because, a good one. I mean, Smith That's was a, a solid contributor a good at one. the receiver position. Yeah. Yeah. Super Bowl, he was great. Yeah. Hey, um, Paul, is it true? But we, is it true? Like, we can. They still can bring up two guys from the practice squad and make it 55 on game day. Can't you bring up a quarterback then? And he'd be part of the team? Sure. All right, then, then there's your third quarterback. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, right. but again, but again, he is, he is still only eligible to come up three times during the season. Remember that. Right. There's a limit to how many right. times you can promote a practice squad guy right. during the year. You get right. three activations, and that's it. And then, so, then you got to make yeah. a decision what to do with them. So that doesn't necessarily solve that issue. Well, and here's the other thing, Charlie. You have to understand, just because you bring up the two guys from the practice squad, you still have inactives on game day. Correct. That's so true, too. Just because you added him to the roster doesn't mean he's going to be one of your active guys. Well, I mean, if you, you know, if you're bringing a quarterback up, then you get your third emergency quarterback. Say, say like, uh, Jones is a little bit hurt. He's got an ankle injury, right? And so then you think, you know, okay, well, let's, we better bring up that third emergency quarterback. Yeah, which they would do on Saturday, the day before the game. But then my point is, Sunday afternoon yeah. before kickoff, you still have right. to hand in your inactives. Your roster sure. doesn't yeah. expand to say, oh, we have now two extra roster spots. You bring him up because you're preparing. He may wake up Sunday morning, his knee flares right. up. So you want to make sure you have all of your issues addressed. Right. But then... Daniel Jones is fine under your hypothetical. Now you decide we're not going to dress the third quarterback. We don't need him. Right, right. But uh, all I'm saying is... There, it's a there very a rare instance, Charlie. It, yeah, but it's a very rare instance. And again, you have a limit that a guy can only come up from the practice yeah. squad three yeah, times during the stupid. season. I mean, that's... That is well, it is what it is. I'm, it look, I'm not sense. telling you it's great. I'm telling you what it is. No, but but you know what? I know. No, I, I under, it, it's an interesting conversation. But if I could just add, I think the reason why there's limitations on not allowing you to call up a guy is because remember, there's a rule in place that if another team signs a player 
off the practice squad. He automatically goes to your 53. So a lot of it, I think, has to do with opportunity for those practice squad players. If you right. don't set a limit, you're basically having them under the control they're of your current They're in hostage. Yeah, but they're why hostage. should they? Why should they be prevented from getting a legitimate 53-man roster spot? I, I so understand. I think the rule has some logic behind it if you peel back the layers of the onion and this <clears throat> Very spider good, and this entanglement. Yes, Very all good. of this language I am adopting. In my arsenal. I'm thank gonna, you. I'm gonna, yes, thank I you. will collect thank a you. rights fee after this show. Oh, that's show. fine. I'd be more than happy. You could talk to I my love people. It. We will work out a percentage. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to throw out, Charlie? Because Paul's got a lot of vocabulary. Yes. <laughs> the only thing I got to say is <clears throat> Ballinger's picture looks a little fishy to me, man. I don't know if you can do that in four months. But anyway, that's Le- leave it to, to the conspiracy theorists. To, uh, <laughs> and the com- on that note, Charlie, it was great talking with you. You know, he made the point about Steve Smith. I was thinking, OK, maybe there's going to be a positive phone call. We had a productive conversation about why there's limitations on call ups in the practice squad. And then came that comment. It's still better than most of his calls. <laughs> well, that may not be saying much, though. <laughs> but leave it to Charlie to examine the photos and determine whether or not Anything is doctored and so forth. But- Bellin- Bellinger's been working his butt off. I mean, I've been here, you know, I'm, I'm here year round and I see it. I, I, this is not this is not something that happened overnight. He has been busting his sure. butt. Well, and this goes back to what we have talked about time and time again. If the team is going to continue to make a positive step forward, where is it going to come from, Paul? The, young the draft guys. classes, right? The young guys. So Bellinger fits under the label that you and I have been preaching, mm-hmm. okay? You could talk all you want about the first-round picks. Those, it goes without saying, need to do the heavy lifting. But when you talk about a fourth-rounder or a fifth-rounder, and that's why I was talking with Jonathan yesterday, unsolicited, Paul, and I'm curious your perspective, Wink was not asked about Micah McFadden. He, he did brought not. him up he on did. his own. He, did. he didn't have to say that. He noted Micah McFadden has shown improvement. Correct. Bellinger is the guy that we're noting on the offensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. What do those two have in common? We're talking mid-late round picks. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is very encouraging. It's early. It's the offseason. They haven't put the pads on. They haven't played physical football. But the fact that you see them putting in the work, that's what you want to see when you have guys enter year two following their rookie year. Well, every coach professes that a player will be smoother, will be more confident, uh, will have a better grasp of the system in year two. Well, what if he doesn't? That's bad, okay? So we all assume, like, that's automatic. Like, flip the calendar, oh, the player is automatically going to be better. It doesn't work that way. So when you hear a coach say, yes, I see the improvement, I see something happening here, well, he's reaffirming to you that there is a progression. So it's very good to hear that. I just, once again, normally around this time of the year, you don't hear coaches want to single out players because Kafka was asked the same question and he didn't jump for the bait. So that's why I thought it was interesting that Wink said, hey, McFadden's caught my eye. And when you look at the depth chart, you know, it still remains to be seen how Wink is going to utilize linebackers, snap count, how much they play. I was looking this up the other day. I actually tweeted it out. McFadden played 39% of the defensive snaps and came on a little bit late in the season. Once again, does he go with an extra defensive back? Does he want to give some of these linebackers opportunities? Until we see some game action, hard to assess. But McFadden, he could be more than just a special teams contributor this season if his trajectory continues to go up. It's funny because, you know, I I remember when there were six preseason games and, and certainly I liked four. I still like four. It's not going to ever happen again. We're probably going to go down to two in another couple of years as they go to 18 regular season games. Yep. And I get that. If it meant trading off preseason games for regular season games, I'm very willing to make that deal. I would sacrifice the preseason games for regular games that count. Yes, I would. But do I think the game is better for it? No, I don't think the game is better for it. I still believe that four preseason games, and this is a great example. We just talked about earlier in the show how OTAs don't tell you a whole lot. Well, the CBA has made your off-season programs, I don't want to say virtually worthless, but they're really lightweight. And when the coaches come out and tell you 
that the preseason snaps are by far going to be the determining factor and the heaviest evaluating point that we're going to give to our players, well, doesn't it make sense that you'd want to have more preseason snaps because that gives you a better chance to correctly identify a player's value? No, I'm with you. I think they would say OTAs holds a great deal of value with respect to the classroom stuff. The meetings. Correct. I think if you ask most coaching staffs, they say that's fine. The mental. Yes. I, I tell people all the time, there are three points to a play, okay? And this is how this is how scouts, GMs, and coaches look at it. There's the alignment, the assignment, and the execution. If any one of those three breaks down, you've got a bust. What we see at OTAs are about the alignment and the assignment. The execution really doesn't come much into play during OTAs. Okay, because alignment and assignment are more mental than they are physical. Sure. And those are the two heavy grades you're getting during the spring. And to finish this thought, I think with respect to the preseason, because you raise an important question from a coaching standpoint. Is there value to have extra preseason games? Yes. I think, though, here's where X's and O's does battle with marketing and appeal, right? Those don't line up, Paul. And player they run safety. They counter to one another. Player safety, Player too, safety, true. Because they'd yeah. rather have those snaps count than not count. Though guys on the bubble would argue from a union perspective, we'll take the extra preseason game if it gives me an opportunity to get more regular season snaps, right? They so, would. I mean, that could be debated, but I think it's more of, are fans going to tune in, Paul, to an extra regular season game that carries weight with respect to W's and L's? Or are they going to tune in to a preseason game even though the coaches find value in that to determine how they want to solidify their roster. And that's where we get. We all know the answer to that one. That's it. You know, so once again, this is, I think it's a battle that every professional sports entity has to walk. It is a business, right? What's good for the product on the field versus what's good for the business, the marketing standpoint of the league. Mm -hmm. And that's where the preseason falls into play. It's, Going to be, I'm sure, an ongoing debate, especially if those first four games, you don't know, polish them up and it starts to continue to well, resemble more like the preseason. And that won't change, by the way. That yep. will not change. We've already let that genie out of the bottle. September football is going to continue to be the most ragged football of the season. And the there most unpredictable. No, there's no way to get around that. With that being said, that is going to wrap up Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Appreciate everybody for tuning in. A reminder, today's episode is part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. We'll be back up and running again on Monday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. Mandatory minicamp next week on Tuesday and Wednesday. So definitely look forward to that as we'll have full coverage here on Giants.com. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadow. Enjoy the weekend, and we will speak to you next week right here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Have a good one.